So anyway, this all works until it doesn't. And it doesn't because basically you can try and cut budgets, but it's zero sum against itself. There's a fallacy of composition built into it. And if everyone's under the gold standard at the same time, the ability to run an inflationary cycle is completely compromised. So the only thing you can do is deflate. So they do. And they deflate and they deflate and they deflate. And the result is, wir sind vor Adolf Hitler. Right? So Keynesianism wasn't written down in a book in 1936 and became influential. There's a beautiful line from John Robinson from a piece from the 70s where she said Herr Hitler was proving in practice in 1935 what Keynes was writing down in theory in 1936. And that was absolutely true. But the really interesting one is the Japanese case here, right? If you've never heard of Takahashi Koryeko, you should. This guy is freaking awesome. Basically, the Japanese military establishment got so pissed off with budget cuts and the whole attempt to get back on the gold standard, 1929 to 1931, the, whole, the gold controversy as it was known, that they started a covert assassination campaign against financiers. They took out two prime ministers, two finance ministers, and half a dozen bankers. Don't tell me austerity doesn't cost the financial sector. <laughs> so eventually they do a night of the long knives when they basically get rid of Taisho democracy. And they bring this guy in, who's this like very old prime minister, uh, uh, ministerial figure, and says, right, you know, can you do something else? And he goes, sure. Let's do massive public works. Let's put up capital controls. Let's basically do the Keynesian checklist. Now, bear in mind, it's an export-dependent economy that hasn't seen growth in 10 years. It's been deflating for a decade. And he manages in his first year to turn around to 4% of GDP, and then they grow up 4 to 6% a year for the next five years, while the rest of the world economy is falling off a cliff. Nothing succeeds like success. Eventually, they murder him and get someone who's even more compliant and generate hyperinflation, which ends up destroying them before the Hell Harbor even happened. But that's another story. So anyway, Keynesianism becomes a reaction to this. Why? Because basically the story refuses to acknowledge two things, fallacies of composition and scalability. Deflation is a classic problem, a classic example of both. Your first best strategy to protect yourself produces a second best outcome every single time. If I'm an individual worker and I try and price myself into a job by accepting a lower wage, the macro effect of that, if everybody does it, is what? Cut consumption. So if consumption cuts, what happens to the price level? The price level goes up in real terms without anybody ever having given anyone a price jag up. So what happens then? The businessman says, I need to cut prices. So I cut prices, I have a fire sale, so does everyone else. What happens? You've just pushed down the price level. What just happened to the real wage? It went up without anybody getting a wage increase. Your individually rational actions don't do anything except produce second order, second best outcome. That's why it's so pernicious and so difficult to get out of. Wherever you have those types of fallacy of composition problems, simple linear action, such as cut the budget and you'll be fine, produce second order outcomes. What this also leads to is the heart of the Keynesian machine to me, which is that expectations are social and investment is a multi-prisoner prisoner's, prisoner's dilemma. I don't know what the future is going to be like, neither do you, but if the past three quarters have sucked, there's probably a heavy weighting that the next one's going to suck. Despite the fact that we had 36 quarters before, I'm doing a huge discount on that time series. And I look to everybody else for signals because really I don't know what's going to do. So if we're all depressed, guess what happens? We have depressed intervention. Nobody will spend. Why are, we, why are American companies sitting on piles of cash? Because everyone else is sitting on piles of cash. Do you want to be the first person to move? What happens if you get burned? You lose market share. So it has the character and the structure of a multi-person multi prisoner dilemma. It also shows us that savings and investment are temporally separate. This is not the Smithian story. Savings does not lead to investment in anything other than an identity. It's not a causal relationship. I can sit on savings for a long time, particularly if I'm on my yacht and I'm heavily armed. If you have an income skew, I don't need to invest and my consumption footprint is small. Hence the whole action on spending is ultimately to alter this, investment demand and investment expectations. This is not the mechanism, hence why it's demand economics and not supply. And what does this mean in terms of the politics? It means that you resolve the can't live with it, can't live without it problem decisively in favour of you needed the state to make the whole thing work. This is it. This is how it works. Now, interestingly, juxtapose this is the end of the 30s, all this is going on, to what happens to Joseph Schumpeter. So this guy is the leading light of the Austrians and the Austrian emigre in exile, the major economist at Harvard Argon Business Cycle Theory. 1942, he brings out, actually, back step a minute, Go back to Hayek, who I haven't really mentioned yet. 1931 shows up at Cambridge. Lionel Robbins gets him a job. And uh, he's dead against all the sort of like incipient public spending arguments and all the rest of it. So, this, so RF Khan, the actual formal, the formalizer of the multiplier, not the inventor, says to him, so Professor Hayek, I'm, I'm asking you, if, if I go out now and buy an overcoat or a raincoat, is that going to make the depression worse? 
And he looked at me and said, yes, but it would take an enormously complex mathematical argument to explain why. And he was literally laughed off the stage. So these guys basically just shut up and retreated at that point in time. They just kept it was the same old chemistry, let's keep going. If you read Capitalism, Social and Democracy, it's 1942, his, his Meister work, it's a fascinating book. He describes the idea of compensatory financing and all this stuff as laughable. He says that basically you can never judge and you can never intervene because capitalism can only be judged over many centuries. So in the long run, you're not dead. In the long run, we can make a judgment when everyone's dead, right? <laughs> that what's really happening is that socialism is really a species of bureaucratization. And as the scale of plant and equipment is rising over time and technology, there's no room for entrepreneurs anymore. So the entrepreneurial spirit has been crushed. Because of this, bourgeois virtue and middle class morality has gone out of the window. And eventually, this will also lead to the end of the bourgeois family. That is literally what his book says. No one reads it. It is a conservative John Galt diatribe. There's nothing else in it. So you can change the subject. You can get on board. You can argue the case. He doesn't address Keynes once in the book. He has 80 pages on Marx, at the end of which he says, was Marx a good business cycle theorist? Ha, <laughs> maybe. That's pretty much what he said. They lost the debate. They're gone. It's over. This is austerity's long winter.